Space Center and how he got involved in NASA coming up and he's a member of the computer club you all know him but you don't know him <laughs> and we'll have the fire department talk about technology their season when they give out a lot of food and uh, if you think of it maybe a, a two dollar three dollar five dollar donation would be good if you want to add some more money in there tonight we'll have the bucket out there at the end of the meeting it's a good cause all 100 percent goes to the program they had all volunteer workers so it really is a highly effective for one dollar contribution, we'll buy eight dollars from the Northwest uh, Food Pantry. So one dollar is really giving eight dollars. Membership is up to 1742. It will be 18 something by the end of the year, almost 19 at the rate we usually get five to 20 a month. It always amazes me that we have that many people still that haven't uh, joined. Oh, I lived here two months. Well, that was those you can understand. But the ones that say we lived here eight years, <laughs> uh, they must have a broken computer and they want it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> this is our general reminder. We still need help. And you got to keep us guessing on new product a new uh, subjects for a meeting we keep talking and always we have a hard time with programs so any help on the programming or anything see me or Dave and uh, we'll try to get it on the schedule right away Okay, the upgrade on Windows 10. How many got the anniversary edition? And if you don't know, have anybody got a computer on Windows 10 that the on power off button has moved off to the left? Okay, you got the new edition. If you got the power button moved off to the left and it doesn't say anything on there until you put the mouse over it, the same power. So if you got that, um, it's a lot more stable system. We should be able, you should be able to run better with the newer system. It's a little tighter code. It should work better. Uh, we've had a few people that in the process of getting it, it's an automatic update that comes through and it could screw your up, this could get screwed up easily by turning off your computer in the middle of the process of an update. It takes anywhere from 
hour and a half to four hours to update. So if you ever see a screen, and the screen will go on and off a couple of times in that process. Uh, one, of people, one of our members said, well, when it came on at night. It went off at night and came on again. And I got up and I turned it off. Well, then she went to turn on her computer and it didn't work. We can fix most of those problems. Uh, bring them in if you have any problem, but if you notice it doing that, and it's doing an update, then you just wait. If you don't have Windows 10, that's a new, it's a three gigabyte file that has to be installed and store many files on it. It's a complete rewrite of Windows. <coughs> so it will take some time. And on the new version, you can set the time of when your computer will do updates and it won't shut off in the middle of the day. I think by default, it's from eight to five it won't shut off. So leave your computer on some nights to, will help uh, get the program installed. Uh, any programs, in fact, any of these updates that come along won't be installed in the daytime now between 8, eight and 5 p.m. local time. So if you have any problems with it, bring it into the lab. We can usually fix them. Sometimes easy, sometimes they are a challenge. With that, I'm going to ask uh, Ken Cozy to come up here and uh, tell us about his amazing, amazing story of how he got involved with the space agency. <coughs> well, it's been an amazing year, Mary and uh, all of you are exceptionally happy the Cubs won the World Series, yay, and the Sun City spacecraft took off, and I'll tell you what that's all about in a second here. I want to share with you something you all can be proud of, because a product created right here in Sun City is now 17 million miles from Earth up there and was launched on September 8th. I want to thank especially the Computer Club Lab for all the help they've uh, given me over the years here to be able to get this ebook going and my computers safe and uh, and up. And I thank God and Mary, my wife, for uh, editing this ebook uh, and for her encouragement. It's been a long process. Okay, let's see if I can handle this. Uh... I can do it. Here. Oh, can you? Okay, please. Thank you. Okay, what you will see today is. Um, the mission, what mission is about, so this is a short 10 minute presentation uh, and I appreciate that, even that amount of time right now. A video of the actual liftoff, pretty exciting. Um, the experience and newsletter articles you probably saw in the Sunday news and uh, a message uh, about uh, what is the ebook and its attachments and links for sending your own message to outer space if you so choose or if you choose to have your grandchildren or children or grandchildren uh, send it. Uh, that's available too. I'll show you how. Okay, Frank, right, next please. Um, what it is about is uh, the uh, NASA uh, graphics of the OSIRIS-REx. The, uh, the actual spacecraft can get this to work here, is over. <clears throat> the actual satellite is over here. Uh, you see that long leg there? It's going to go right on the asteroid to get a sample of that, put it into this cap here, which is going to open up and then puts it inside, and then it's going to go back to Earth. These are the um, solar panels that give it the energy. It also has uh, some fuel inside as well. And uh, what is it about? Well, it's exploring our past because this asteroid that they're looking at is from the beginning of the Earth. And uh, also uh, securing our future because this asteroid in less than 100 years, it's going to crash into Earth according to its current uh, orbits. So we want to be able to study it and know how to move it safely away. Uh, OK, Frank. Right. This is an astro <coughs> sample return uh, mission. And uh, uh, what it is, uh, you have uh, rockets here, the Atlas, the Centaur, and the, and the uh, solid return booster uh, are the rockets on the ship. And uh, it's, high, it's 15 stories high. 
It's over 750,000 pounds, it's 325 tons that just got lifted off. Uh, and the satellite itself is about the size of a small car, eight by eight by 10. Okay, right? Here we go, here's the, here's the actual video. Five, four, three, two, one. Osiris Rex, his seven-year mission to boldly go to the asteroid Bentley and attack. experience when you're actually there. It is different from anything you see on video or in the movie theaters or IMAX even. To see it or take off is amazing. I wrote it up in an uh, article that's in the uh, Sunday uh, newspaper and, um, and uh, this um, uh, shows it in a little more detail as to what the experience is if you have one. I have extra copies up here if you haven't seen it already. Uh, I was taking a video with my iPhone with my left eye and on my right eye I'm watching it go up. What an experience. I mean, there were people there, thousands of people from all over the world. And they were all applauding and yelling and screaming and tearing. I mean, everybody was crying after a while. It is just such an emotional event. 10 years of effort on the part of the scientists to make this go. <clears throat> the name of it is the uh, or Osiris Rex uh, uh, spacecraft. And it stands for Origin, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, and Regolith Explorer. How's that for? <laughs> Only a scientist can come up with something like that. But actually, each one of those words do mean something. Here's the uh, the uh, Atlas uh, V rocket. Here's that solid state booster that you saw uh, shoot off. Later in the in the process, this shoots off, and then this finally the Centaur a rocket shoots off. This is a fairing that covers the spacecraft, the uh, the uh, the satellite itself, and of course that also. Uh, 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 tears off. And then this is the spacecraft with a little bigger uh, picture of it. It's kind of dark, but it's uh, because it's, it's in space. <laughs> okay, Frank. Um, <clears throat> uh, what was in the spacecraft is 7,000 people from all over the world contributed artwork uh, at NASA's invitation, and I was one of them. I was just completely uh, overwhelmed. 
I just finished uh, the ebook uh, that I was writing, and then they asked for artwork, so I submitted it along with some photos. And um, and uh, the book ebook is a Christmas nativity story, and I also put it in seven computer uh, translated languages, also kind of make it a Rosetta Stone, <coughs> and gave it an introduction to seven dimensional communications, which is um, what uh, we use as human beings to communicate. It really boils it down to to uh, a dimensional uh, array, uh, and of course, blessings for NASA. All of this is available, by the way, on the, um, on the website, so you can uh, take a look at it, right? Thank you. Uh, to do that, all you've got to do is uh, enter kencozy.com and then click ebook, read online, and you can actually read the ebook itself or you can go to the NASA launch and uh, actually see the uh, seven-dimensional communications information, et cetera, that was sent in the air in the spacecraft 7,000 miles. Now, all that was created right here in Sun City in the last 10 years. So I thank you for your encouragement and support, okay? Um, now, how about sending your own message to space? You think that's impossible? No, it's not. It's actually quite re realistic. Um, but do you ever think of writing something for your future descendants? I don't mean just children and grandchildren and, and great-grandchildren. How about those thousand years from now? It is possible to do that. What would you say and how would you send it in a time capsule to outer space? Okay. And here's how you do it. Now, I've distributed on the, uh, on the tables and on the chairs and there's more copies available if you like. Uh, the address, these addresses are in there where you can uh, go to in order to send your message. Uh, first is keo.org. It's uh, You can send the message of up to 6,000 characters. It's a free service, and it's engineered to return to the Earth in 50,000 years. <laughs> so think about that. <laughs> what would you like to say? What words of wisdom would you like to give them? If sure the computer is plugged in. <laughs> it's, it's a whole different world out there going to be. And uh, you can see there uh, frequently asked questions, and uh, you can go to here to, to actually uh, write the message. It's on the website, so you have to just click that uh, an address there and it'll go there. That's one way of doing it. It's free. The other way is from the Planetary Society, which works with NASA to send names of members and messages uh, on selected missions. If you go to planetary.org, uh, it's there. Uh, if you join, your name's going to be on a future spacecraft going out in space in many of the missions that, that NASA is, uh, is planning. Um, now, there is a membership uh, due, so that part is not free. But it's, it's an interesting society, I will say that. Uh, I happen to send mine out free, <laughs> which I always like to do. Uh, and, um, and, and so I, it didn't cost me anything to do that. Okay, Frank? Thank you. you can also uh, give the ebook free as a gift if you want. Everything's free. I, there's no charge for anything. You can go to the website. Any one of those uh, ebooks uh, are available to you. Uh, you can download it. You can give it as a gift to your children or great grandchildren or, or wherever. Uh, great nephews and nieces in my, in my case. Um, and it's, uh, it's downloadable. You can give them this. And you know, the kids nowadays, they don't use books in school. Remember going over uh, to uh, 158 District? The kids don't use books, they use computers. And everything's e-books. So if you want to give them a gift, this is a way to do it. Just print that out, put their name on it, and say, here, Charlie, Jane, here's a gift for you for Christmas. It's a freebie, but the uh, point is that they'll probably like it because there are over 100 internet links uh, inside, of these, inside of this book that go to various uh, pictures, artwork, music, et cetera, uh, that are available. So it's free and you can also, they can also read it online if they want. Okay, right. Um, and uh, I've done this uh, presentation to the Italian American Club and I told them about some of the Italian Americans involved with the space program. Uh, I'm going to be giving this talk to the Polish American Club telling them about some of the Polish Americans who, um, who uh, were part of the space program. This is true for every, you know, we're all sons and daughters of immigrants, great, great, great grandfather uh, of ours. And, uh, and uh, it's interesting there is, there's every, every uh, nationality was involved in the space program. And thank you as a taxpayer for making this possible. 
that cost $800 million to do this project. It's going to save the Earth eventually because it's, you, don't want, you don't want a meteor that size to uh, crash into us. So it's a very good investment. But it's your taxes and my taxes that have paid for it. And um, I think we all should be proud of it and proud of America to do this kind of thing. OK, thank you. Okay. Well, we'll uh, have a few questions. Time for about five questions. And I'm going to give the first one. What uh, this was going up to this asteroid, and it was going to drill the hole and take the sample back. How long was this round trip to bring it back to the Earth? That's going to go up and come back. How long is that going to be? Seven years. Seven years. The whole trip that the uh, spacecraft will make is 4.4 billion miles. Not million, a billion miles. So it's taking seven years to do it. It's actually going to, and you know, you don't want to disturb an asteroid in its orbit, right? <laughs> you don't want to change its orbit once you know where it's going. So it's going to come down with that arm and actually touch the surface for five seconds. They have um, an ingenious way to do it is to blow the regolith, that is the, the surface of the asteroid, into a container and then get immediately out of the way. But it's going to study that asteroid for over a year, take pictures and get everything that's in there, know what it's about, because in future missions, like for example to go to Mars and other places, we're going to need some materials up there in space. And these asteroids are just a throve of, of material, including water, believe it or not, is out there. Uh, and you see comets, right? Comets, all that stream, that's ice. It's, it's streaming out of comets. So we want to know a lot about it. Okay, Frank, thanks. Uh, so what are we going to do 100 years from now when it's going to crash to Earth? You know what you said? Well, no, uh, thanks for clarifying that. It's a good question. I may have confused people. First of all, seven years from now, it's going to take this sample and send it to Earth. It's going to land in Utah. Believe it or not, they've already done something like this, so they can pinpoint it that well. But then, this, then the satellite itself will go, keep going and go into orbit around the sun ad infinitum until one of these days, somebody smart enough to say, what is that out there? And they go and capture it, and that's when they'll be able to read all this, this e-book and all the other information that we have on it. The other one, the Keo.org, that's the one that is scheduled to go up into space, and then and by its own actual power and uh, calculations will come back down to Earth in 50,000 years. Those are two separate events. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. They're thinking of bumping it somewhere along the line. Yes. And change yes. the orbit. Uh, yes. But they have to do that very carefully. <laughs> they don't want to make a, make a big hit. Okay, a couple questions. Anybody else have any questions? There's one. With one more question. We'll take the audience, and the rest of the time, the rest of you can come up after the meeting, talk to Ken. Thank you. I'm just curious. How were the pictures taken of the um, rocket seven miles down the way where there it looked like it was so close? That is a good question, and usually the answer is it's secret. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, we have, uh, thank God, the military have done a terrific job and, and private industry helping in the process. Done a terrific job of, of, um, of picture taking of sat from satellites and land and also an aircraft. That's how we can keep track of uh, any enemies we might have, uh, what they're doing. And so from, this, from these other planes that were flying along secretly, they took these pictures up close. You couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. You know, all we see is a little dot up there, and even with a high-powered telephoto, it was nothing like that. So they have uh, they have some really good uh, picture-taking uh, capability, and that's how that came out. Okay, thank and thank you very much. It was a experience, I'm sure. Okay, our next, uh, I think it's uh, Ralph's turn to talk about training. Got one class. Okay. Oh, there's what I have. There. It'll come back. I, I hope it'll come back. That's okay. There's only there's only two. That's a new rainbow. Okay. Well, actually, the, um, we didn't have too many classes for November. One of them's already been uh, taught, but there's two more coming up. Next Wednesday will be Windows 10, 
At 6.30 in the evening, Will Gertie will teach uh, Windows 10 again, if you can make that. And then uh, George Sebastian will be teaching manage your financial records using Google Finance or Yahoo Finance, and that's gonna be on Wednesday the 16th at one o'clock. So that's just in time so you can pay your taxes next April. But um, a couple of things, if you're concerned that we don't have too many classes, that's because we need more teachers. And I, once again, I got the sheet over there uh, looking for more uh, monitors and for the lab and, and more teachers. Also, if you're so inclined, you know, many of you, not myself, but many of you have Windows computers, but you may have an iPhone or an iPad and quite often they come into the lab and have questions about transferring pictures, doing this and that. Well, the uh, Apple group meets uh, on the second and fourth Tuesday from nine until 11.30. And it's not just Mac computers. They talk about iPhones and iPads. So as long as you're a member of the computer club, you might as well go to the Apple group if you have any questions about your pad or your, or your phone. So that'd be another way to, to learn something, you know, regarding computers. And then um, Jeff Stipes has a really great class going on photography. They meet the first Wednesday of every month from 7 to, is it 9.30, Jeff? Not about, yeah, about 8.30. However long people have questions. But I mean, when you go into the lab, I know most of you have now seen the TV set that, uh, or the monitor that's on the wall with all the lovely pictures that uh, his group is taking. They've had um, pictures at the bank. They've had them at um, uh, the head of the library. So, you know, we're, we're getting some, some publicity of our computer club through the uh, Photo SIG group. And if you're interested in photography, have any questions about your camera, that's the place to go because those guys are really good. Also, once again, we need help in the lab. Keep that in mind. We don't have any classes in December because everybody's out Christmas shopping and buying all their Cubs gear. Uh, but starting in January, we'll be back in classes again. And once again, keep in mind, I keep asking, you, I need, more, need more help on teaching. If there's a class you think you can teach and if you haven't seen it, see me. We'll get that baby scheduled. Thanks. Okay, some of these community managers were having uh, the board meetings, there's no board meeting in November, it's in December, and we missed the first uh, committee of the whole meeting was the last week, so those are the dates of the next board meeting. <coughs> Here's a, a little blurb, you got a new registration cards are gonna come out, and they're gonna start December 5th, and I would suggest you look in page eight of your lifestyle and you'll see when you're supposed to go to the Fountain View area and have a new picture and your card and all the information will be updated at that time just to be sure it's correct for the new computer system. So let's see how fast we can get everybody on this new system which will be interesting. It will be December and January for the folks that are here. Now, if you're going to your, if you look in the lifestyle and you see uh, January 15th or 17th, and you're leaving on the 6th, you can come anytime. I would say just go a little later than the opening time, and it will make a card for you, you regardless if your neighborhood is not on the list for that day. So, the name of the game is if you're going south. Don't miss it. Go early and uh, get your car beat in December before you head off to uh, the warm weather and leave us all up here to freeze. <laughs> the mobile medical lab will be here again December 16th. And with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Bonnie. Blazer, who is a, a trustee in the fire district, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be a trustee uh, in the fire district for over the over the last eight years. Uh, it's been a real privilege, and I've enjoyed doing that. Uh, Chief Carl has led us through accreditation again for the second time, and uh, there are only 32 districts in the state that are accredited and there's only six in the country 
that have both fire and police um, accredited. So it was a, it, it's where some uh, assessors come in and assess everything that you can possibly imagine, water, station, times, and everything. It's a, a very interesting experience, and we're proud to have been awarded that. Chief has been with the district for 17 years, and he's been our chief for the last four, and we're very pleased to have him as our chief. I, without further ado, here's Chief Cottle. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I actually worked. There you go. All right. So um, I will start off, start off a little bit about what we are, what we do, and then that kind of just tails right into the technology part of it. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to explain that technology if you don't know what we do and why we need technology. So a little bit about myself. So as Bonnie mentioned, I've been the chief now for uh, exactly four years and two days. Uh, not that I've been counting, but I just had my anniversary the other day. Um, I'm going to walk around a little bit because I don't like to stand by the podium because then everybody over here feels like being left out. So I'll be bouncing back and forth. Um, so chief for four years, uh, 17 years in the department, but I've been in a job for 28 years. I know I look really young. It's, it's the Huntley water, I assure you. It keeps me young. All right. uh, 28 years. I started in a very small community, me and Bergen, it's called Cicero. Uh, so I'm a Cicero boy. Uh, uh, born and bred, born in Cicero. That's where I'm from. That's how long I've been uh, doing it. Uh, so back in the day with Aunt Betty Lauren Maltese, uh, is kind of where I started. For those that know Aunt Betty. And I, and I call her Aunt Betty only because I was a police officer at the time and I actually had her details. So I sat many a nights in front of her house. So that's why I can call her Aunt Betty. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm married, uh, happily married, according to my wife, uh, for the last five years. Uh, I have a uh, newly, well, he's, he's five now going on, on 25. I have a five-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter that I think I'm into, three pink ponies, two Barbie dream houses and a Barbie Corvette right now. So. She's got daddy wrapped around her finger pretty good. Um, so a little bit about the fire district. So, you know, we, we really not uh, just about putting out fires anymore. Actually, we don't really do a lot of firefighting really at all anymore, which is great. I mean, after all these years of beating into people's heads of uh, smoke detectors and carbon dioxide detectors and sprinkler systems, it's finally working. Uh, we average probably six or eight fires a year most of them are very small, usually have one decent sized fire a year. Luckily for us, the fires that we go to are all are to our mutual aid departments or all our neighboring departments. Uh, but for Huntley proper for us, really is pretty minimal on fire. What we really do a lot of is ambulance. Um, <laughs> and Del Webb is our number one customer, let me tell you that. Thank you. Um, so as you can see up here, we cover about 55 square miles. Uh, so that's a lot of area. So we basically cover all of Huntley, a good portion of Lake and Hills, Algonquin, uh, Rutland, Dundee, Hampshire, and an unincorporated Canaan McHenry County. So basically for us, we go as far north as Route 170, uh, 176, as far south as um, Big Timber, as far uh, west as Route 20, and as far east as the other side of um, Boulder Ridge Country Club. So that's the area that we cover. In that area, we have four fire stations. They're staffed 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Del Webb has their own private fire station right down the street. Everybody knows they're Bright Pine 7-Eleven. I'm sure you see the engine or the truck and the ambulance flying through town all day long. Um, but that's uh, station three. Station three is assigned to Del Webb. Um, and then we also have two other facilities that you may notice up there. One that we call the training facility. We have our own training facility uh, on the far northwest of our district where we can actually do live fire training, uh, hazard material training, anything that a firefighter needs to train on, we can do at this facility, including landing an aircraft out there because the concrete's 12 inches thick. So we had to make it heavy enough and designed enough for the whole the way the fire apparatus um, that we can do everything out there. Because we don't do those fires every day and because fire, our fires are few and far and from, and as everybody knows, if you don't do it, you lose it. So we have to stay up on those skills. So we're able to go out there monthly and practice on pretend fires uh, and keep those skills up. And then we have one other building called what we call the Annex Building. The Annex Building is pretty much kitty corner across from the Village Hall, right across the street from the uh, Huntley Public Library. Uh, and there is a large building, 25,000 square feet. That's where we keep our fleet mechanics at, our spare fire apparatus, 
we do community events like cpr and first aid our, our board meetings are kept out there trainings kept out there the really nice thing about that building being so large is when our bad weather comes and it's coming soon as we all know it's already november um, we can actually take the troops inside and we can do all those evolutions that we'd normally do outside actually inside so that not only are we still doing training we're still doing it safely because the last thing we need to do is have a firefighter slip on ice while they're pulling holes wearing an air pack that just that sets everybody up for failure so those are kind of the, the facilities that we have. We have 58 full-time firefighters, 30 part-time firefighters. Uh, we run just shy of uh, 4,600 calls for last year. That's a typo, it's actually for 2015. 2016, we'll see about a three and a half, four percent increase. That's about what we average. So of those uh, 4,600 calls, 80% of that is ambulance type related calls. Slip, trips, falls, transports to the hospital. Of that 80%, 39% of it is directly out of Del Web. So like I said, you are our number one customer. We really like you guys a lot, uh, but we don't like you that much. So um, believe it or not, our Station 3, um, which is here in Del Web, those guys and girls, that's a requested station. Uh, there's actually a waiting list for people to get into that station. They request that station. I don't know if it has anything to do with the cookies and cakes that show up on a regular basis. So, <laughs> for some strange reason, I'm thinking it might have something to do with it. So, so what do we do? So like I said, about 79% of what we do, so 8 out of every 10 calls we go on is something related to paramedics or ambulance. The rest of that is broken up into trouble alarms, fire alarms, uh, actual types, small types of fires, uh, it could be uh, elevator emergencies, 911 call hang-ups, uh, wrong calls, a, a, an array of things. Um, we do hazardous materials response, we do fire investigations, we have specialized rescue teams. So if someone's stuck on a water tower, or if someone's stuck below grade, we have those teams already in-house that are already trained. And that was not me, I did not do that. Um, so we have all those specialty teams in-house already working for us. Uh, this here is 983, truck 983, and you can tell it's a truck because it's got that real big long letter across the top. That's the, that's the truck that's stationed here in Del Webb at Station 3, along with one of the new ambulances. So, you know a little bit about me, you know a little bit about us. So how does technology really work for the fire service? Well, as we know, technology is a phenomenal thing when it works, but when it doesn't, not so good. So we have backups for backups for backups, especially when it comes to life-saving things. So we're going to talk about a few things that we do in-house, uh, how we deal with the same problems that you do every day with Windows 10 upgrades and upgrading in the middle of the night when the guys get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to do an ambulance call, they come back to do a report and the computer's down because of getting upgraded. So we have to deal with those issues too. Uh, we can, I'll, I'll kind of go through how we deal with that. But we have everything from computer-aided dispatch to um, public access cameras. Uh, there's about 600 cameras in our jurisdiction that I have access to, not only on my smartphone, but my iPad. Right from my iPad, I can actually, and I'll show you some photos. Um, some of the photos are going to look a little fuzzy or grayed out or dark. That's for a reason. That's because they're actual runs or actual calls. And to protect the innocents, I don't want to show any information. So, um, and I'll explain what those are. So, but in the bottom right-hand corner here, the bottom photo, that's actually the cab of one of our fire engines. In every one of our fire apparatus, no matter if it's an ambulance, an engine, a truck, um, the battalion chief, the chief that's in charge of the streets, uh, they all have computers in them. And what happens is when you dial 911 and you give your information to that dispatcher and it says, oh, that's a Huntley Fire Department call, automatically across that screen comes your name, your address, your phone number, who you are, if there's anything pertinent we need to know about you, if you're on oxygen, special medications, a key code to get into your garage, it's all on our screen. And it takes it one step further for that because as we know firemen, we like to keep things simple. And actually we can push a button and it'll actually say that fire engine A is right here, the house is right here, we'll tell you how to get there. And we'll tell you how to get there two different ways in case there's traffic. So which is really, really nice. Which works great when the technology is up. When technology goes down, we still have in every one of our fire apparatus a real big six, eight inch binder that we open up. And it's kind of like Santa's naughty list. We open it up, it's that big, and we go through it page by page, get to the name, get to the name of the street, and that tells us how to get to your street. When I first got on Huntley, which was <coughs> April of 2000, Del Webb was in the very beginning stages. Every morning when we came on duty, there was two sheets of paper on the bulletin board. Those were the new streets 
that were new from the last time we were on duty. So we had to learn about 20, 40 new streets every time we walked on duty for about eight months. It was pretty difficult. I remember times in the middle of the night, and I'm not kidding, and, and it's kind of sad, at 3 o'clock in the morning, we would meet in the middle of the intersection with the fire department and the police department and say, okay, where do you guys think it's at? Where do you guys think it's at? I think I remember that street's over here, and we would go to it. Because back then, they didn't have street. The street signs weren't even up yet. Everything was from memory. Everything was from pieces of paper, napkins, crayons, things we learned the hard way. So we've come a long way just in 16 years um, from where we were when Del Webb first opened his doors to where we are today. I mean, if you're at one of the pavilions and you dial 911 from your cell phone one of the pavilions, I know what pavilion you're dialing it from. That's how good it is now. So we've come a long way with technology, and that's all because of technology. So snapping notifications. So it's great that we have all this technology out there, but if we have the big one, if Huntley Fire Department's having that big call of the year, and Channel 7 News and Channel 9's going to be there, how do my guys know that there's something going on? So everybody in the world, pretty much, except for my mom, she still has a flip phone, which is okay, it works, it dials 911, that's all I care. But everybody in the world's got, a, got some type of smart something, a smart phone, smart tablet, whatever. When we get an incident, and it's something serious enough, it automatically comes to our phone, but the information you see on the left-hand side, it gives us the type of call, where it's at, the address, the location, it gives us a little tiny map next to it, it shows, if you can probably, I don't know if you can see it, but up top it's got a little blue, uh, a little red B, and on the bottom it's got a green A. A is where you're at, B is where you need to be. So it shows you how to get there. So that's how we started that simple from just from our troops getting from the scene of the firehouse to where the actually incident's at. So it, it, it's, and it's nice to have this backup because for some reason we lose connection. Verizon's working on their tower in the area, they didn't tell us, so we're not getting, the, getting our stuff from our dispatch center and our computers, in our vehicles, this is our backup. So we have a backup for our backup for our backup. So we always have some type of backup. So it gives us an actual call taker information. It really does tell us what's going on. You know, we can get a call and say, you can go into 123 Main Street for the victim that fell. And the person can be talking to us that calmly but in the background, we didn't know that they fell down three flights of stairs. You know, so there's things that really are important to us that we need to know. Right here in the narrative, it tells me victim fell down three flights of stairs. We already know that now. So now we come in, we don't come in with a clipboard to thinking that we're just going to pick you up, put you back in the bag, but you're going to be okay. We come in with the troops, we come in with all the equipment. So the technology really does help us in the long run. Again, it does map directly to the address. And then any smart device, and it's not picky. It doesn't care if it's Apple, it doesn't care if it's Mac, it doesn't care what it is. As long as it's smart, we can get the data to it. Mobile data terminals, MDTs, uh, basically it's the computer that's in our vehicles. Um, it's, a, it's a high tech tablet. It's, a, um, it's what I call a firefighter proof tablet. Um, I can chuck it out a window, I can drive a fire engine over it, I can open up a fire hose on it. That's what it's designed for. It's designed, it's above military spec because we learned that in the military, any of us that's ever been in the military, we can break things pretty good in the military. If you give it to a fireman, they can break it that much quicker. So they really don't do military spec anymore, they do firefighter spec. It's a much higher spec now. Uh, so it's designed for us. Everything in our, every one of our vehicles have backlit keyboards, so in the middle of the night they can see the keys. Uh, the screens are touch screens, which is really nice. They all have nice, easy cursors and, and mouses to use. But on there, right away, it tells us, and up on the top one there, it was really kind of grayed out a little bit, but it's an actual call that came in. It'll tell us the nature of the call, where the call is at, who it's for, and what's the nature about it. Um, has everybody or anybody here called the, uh, the PEP program, the Premise Alert program? So the Premise Alert program is something that became a law about three or four years ago here in the state of Illinois that there's something that's pretty vital about your home. <clears throat> and it can be something as simple as you have really large dogs that like to lick us, or you have lots of oxygen tanks in your, in your house, or you're prone to falling, or hard of hearing. You can fill out this form. It gets sent to us. We send it to our dispatch center. 
and they will put that information right in on our screen. So when it pops up, not only does it pop with your name and address and your phone number and where we're supposed to go, a little window blinks that says, hey, there's some more information you need to know about this individual. And it could be something as simple as a garage code, stuff like that. And someone's running out of batteries. The other really nice thing about having computers in our vehicles is it gives a real-time stamp. I can't tell you how many times we've gotten phone calls, it took you 15 minutes to get to my house. Well, unless we're coming from the other side of Hampshire, it doesn't take anything to get 15 minutes when we're coming lights and sirens, I assure you. We all drive pretty fast and have lights and sirens on. So it allows us to do real-time stamping. So as soon as my fire engine pulls up on the scene, they take their microphone, they tell dispatch we're on the scene. They also touch the screen that says on scene. So there's a synchronous timestamp there that allows for both of them to say, yep, they were on the scene at 801. They know exactly what time we got on the scene. They know exactly what time we went in route because there's a button that we push that says in route. So it makes real time stamping very, very nice for us. It allows us not only for checks and balances to make sure that the troops are getting their butts out of bed and getting down their street where they're supposed to be, but it also makes sure for accreditation purposes they were making their time parameters because they're very, very strict time parameters. We need to make 80% um, of all our calls in under eight minutes, and that's district wide. So that's a pretty tight time parameter. And that's total time, that's not just drive time, that's time from you picking up your phone, dialing 911, giving the information, the dispatcher then taking the information, dispatching us, us getting in the rig, getting the rig started, getting it down the street, and getting it to your house. Eight minutes is, is, is our time parameter, and we meet that, we exceed those numbers. There you go, so ambulances. Ambulances have come a long way, and that back. And I grew up in the city, so I'm used to the old Cadillac yeah, ambulances. I love them to death. That was the first time I ever my first ambulance. I was driving the back of one of those was in a caddy, and it's probably the only time I've ever been in a Cadillac since then. Um, but other than that, so this is our brand new ambulance, uh, ambulance 952. <clears throat> this is up at Station Two, which is um, just north of the new hospital. Station Three and Station One. Uh, station one is downtown, station three is in Del Webb. We'll be receiving the same ambulances this January. We ordered two new ones, uh, station three and station one are next due to get them. State of the art ambulances. Um, when I mean state of the art, I mean very expensive ambulances. <laughs> I guess when you put big words like that to anything or you attach firefighter to anything, it triples the price. So an ambulance is like, like this fully equipped, um, right around $310,000. But because there's a hospital now in town, I can now elongate that time frame that we can use it because we get about five years out of an ambulance. So if you take that $300,000 and break it over five years, it's not so bad. But now that if I go seven years on that same $300,000, we're getting a bigger bang for our buck. So these are our new ambulances that we just were taking delivery of. Uh, we got a bunch of new technology in there and hopefully uh, nobody in here has had to use one lately. Um, but some new neat, things that are coming in all our ambulances. So all of our ambulances are have what we call a 12 lead EKG, a 12 lead cardiac monitor, which basically means it takes a three dimensional picture of your heart. And the nice thing about that is that old school cardiac monitors is really just two dimensional. We can see from one side through the other side. Kind of guesstimate that you're probably having a heart attack, treat you for that. Three dimensionally, I can actually tell you what part of your heart's being affected by the heart attack and how to treat it that much better. But we can take it one step further. I actually send a picture of your heart from the back of my ambulance sitting in front of your house to the cardiologist that's on duty. And I'll show you that in just one second. No lift stretchers. I can't tell you how many times I blew a back out or I pulled a shoulder or I sprung an ankle or something trying to lift the patient in the back of the ambulance because our old stretchers were two people, you had to pull them out, bring them down, lift them back up, the legs fell down, and then you brought them in the hospital. I got a nice little video that a couple of my guys volunteered, like when the chief volunteers, <laughs> volunteered two of my guys to do a video for us and our new lift technology. We averaged about six injuries a year relating to just cots, lifting people. Now remember, we're, we're lifting anywhere from 250 to 550 pounds, depending on the size of the person. Uh, and then obviously the way of the cot itself. So our cots are uh, rated for a 500 pound patient plus the weight of the cot. So it does add up quickly. 
and then we'll talk a little bit about pulse oximetry and capnography and what that means for a patient. So there's a 12 lead EKG. This is a three-dimensional picture of your heart. Most of you have probably seen this on TV or if you've ever been with your own cardiologist just seeing this. But this is an actual, this is what actually gets sent to the cardiologist that's on duty at the hospital. This is what he gets on his smartphone. He'll be standing in the ER. He knows that hopefully ambulance 953 is coming and it'll come across the screen on his phone exactly as you see it. And he'll look at that and say, yeah, you have a heart attack. They need to go right to cardiac cap. So no more stopping at the ER, getting a 12 lead EKG done, getting some labs drawn, talking to the nurse, doing all, you go straight to cardiac cath, and right away you're getting treated. So we're eliminating anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes of that delay of time. So right away we're getting people in the cardiac cath, with, and our best time is under 12 minutes. From scene to cardiac cath is 12 minutes. So phenomenal. And as we know, the longer you are away from a cardiac cath, or the longer your heart's starving for oxygen, means more death of that tissue that's happening. So the sooner we can get that in and get it fixed, that means more heart muscle that we're saving, which means way better for you in the long run. So that's what an actual 12 lead EKG that's actually transmitted to the hospital right to the doctor looks like. Um, and a really nice thing about that is every one of them that gets transmitted also comes back to our, our, our EMS coordinator. We have a paramedic that's in charge, like a chief paramedic is in charge of all the paramedics. Every one of these gets um, kind of inventory. They go through the entire call, quality assurance, we've done on it, the whole nine, nine yards, make sure that we didn't miss anything either. Uh, that's the 12 lead monitor itself. We use a Zoll monitor. Can anybody guess what a cardiac monitor runs nowadays? <laughs> that cardiac monitor, the way it's set up right now, is $35,000. And I got nine of them. Because every one of our ambulance has them, we have four ambulances, and every one of our fire engines or trucks are also paramedics. So no matter what shows up in front of your house, you are getting an ambulance, whether you can take it to the hospital or not. It has paramedics on it, it has all the drugs on it, it has all the cardiac monitoring on equipment on it. So no matter what shows up first, certificate of care immediately can be started in a patient that needs it. So $32,000 times that by nine, you can figure the numbers out on that. It gets pretty expensive, but one life saved because of that pays for itself. It has. So bottom right hand corner here, those are my two volunteers. That's our no cot list system. Uh, it's by Stryker. Uh, eliminates injuries, period. Like I, be I began to mention earlier, we average about six injuries a year on firefighters, either tweaking a back, blowing out an ankle, twisting a knee, whatever. Now it's literally, I get, I sprained my finger or my thumb hurts because I have to push the button. Are you able to click on, <laughs> click on that video for me, Dr. Ryan? And normally it takes two people to do it. Because Josh Kelper, the one standing up, uh, is Josh is Josh, he's going to do it by himself. He's going to shout at you. technology at its finest right there. Right there, if I've been doing this for 28 years, I wish I had that 20 years ago because I got this lower back thing going on. It is not getting any better. I'd be proven just doesn't cut it anymore. <coughs> so that's some of the technology. So technology is great when it comes to smartphones and it comes to iPads and, and computers. And, but it's those little things, just those economically things that we can change that can make a career of firefighter. I can't tell you how many of my friends have pensioned up because they blew out three or four discs in their lower back because they had a patient fall on them in the middle of winter. Um, or we've dropped patients in the middle of winter because we're standing on three inches. Everybody knows how driveways get after a snow and then you walk on it and trample on it and it turns to ice and then snow's on top of that and then more ice on top of that. You know, I can't tell you how many times you know, we've, we've dropped patients, you know, God forbid, it's not something we go up and you know, we're going to drop patients today. That's not our intent, but it happens, unfortunately, but this type of technology right here really does eliminate that problem for us. 
And as you can see, Josh really didn't have to have any stress or anything. He used one finger to push the button. It's really simple. It's got a plus for up and a minus for down, so you really can't mess it up. <laughs> the colors change for you. So when it was going in, it was green. When it gets in there, it turns red or yellow. Uh, I think it turns amber, which means it's locked in, doesn't come out. And the really nice thing about that is, God forbid, we get in a vehicle accident and our ambulance actually rolls over. The old stretchers actually came out of their holders, and the stretcher would actually come off their hooks. And now the, there's not only the, the people in the back of the ambulance spinning, but now I've got a stretcher back there with a patient attached to it spinning. Now these actually, because of the requirements by the federal uh, statute, the federal laws, it, it does not come loose even on a rollover, which is another benefit for us. One right direction. So automatic vehicle locators, so AVLs, this can be a little grayed out and um, I'll explain what it is. So basically at any given time, and it's really great for chiefs because I can check up with my guys at any given time. So on here, basically lists out all of our vehicles. It tells us the status of our vehicle. It tells me the officer that's on the vehicle. And it kind of tells me where they're at and what they're doing. So at any given time, I can look and say, oh, ambulance 952 is on a call at that address. If I click on that address, it tells me where that ambulance is at at that given point. Because it could be in route to the hospital, it could be on the scene, it could still be in route to that hospital or in route to that location. So I click on it and it actually gives me where they're at, tells me how fast they're going, and if they're stationary, it'll actually give me a, station, a stationary picture view thanks to Google, because Google does that for everything now, no matter where you are in the country. I know what an intersection looks like thanks to Google. It'll actually give me the intersection. So this is an actual fire alarm that we went out the other day, and this is um, the uh, workout club facility in Algonquin behind um, Buffalo Wild Wings on Rangel Road. Um, uh, it's a lifetime. Life, lifetime fitness, thank you. Um, we're looking at lifetime fitness. That's where they were going on a fire alarm. So if my guys, uh, new lieutenants and new guys, okay, where's lifetime? We're up front of blank, where's lifetime? They click the button. Oh, lifetime, I know where that's at. They're behind Buffalo Wild Wings. I don't know where that's at. So this way they can get their net. Again, a backup for the backup for the backup. So not only does it give me the actual map, but it also gives me a picture of what it looks like and where it's at. Because as you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, every house in Del Webb looks alike. <laughs> every house looks alike. <laughs> They may have a different bush in the front or a different tree in the corner, but they all look alike at 3 o'clock in the morning. And if your lights aren't flashing, we're really in trouble. So that's a really nice thing about that is it'll actually give us a pick view of where we're actually going. Again, technology at its finest. Again, this all works great when the servers are up and Google's working great and we've got good connections. Great stuff. Again, if it doesn't, we're back to that old big black book, opening it up, going to the page number, looking it up that way. But again, we can still get there. Video conferencing. We implemented this probably <coughs> 10 years ago, maybe a little less. So basically what this means is because we cover 55 square miles, we have four fire stations, and every fire station is responsible for a specific area of those 55 square miles. I don't like taking fire stations, meaning firefighters and equipment, out of their areas and putting them in another area because that leaves that area then unprotected. What this then does allow is it allows my firefighters to stay in their fire stations and do video conferencing training. So this way, they're right now, they're doing um, what we call Con Ed, uh, continuing education for their paramedic license. I don't need them all to come to one building to talk, listen to the instructor talk about cardiac monitors. They can all sit in their fire stations, do video conferencing, all get the same training, and they're still in their still districts. The very first day we put this in service, now back in the day when, before we got this, everybody had to go downtown and meet for our trainings twice a month, which took everybody out of their still districts um, and took them out of their areas of responsibilities. Very first day we put this in service, station three here in Del Webb, as someone drives to the station was having a massive heart attack, and they were in quarters because they were on the polycom system. For the first day we used it, the system paid for itself because we had a save on it. The individual was having the, he was having the big one. It was the big one. Uh, we were able there, because we had to respond then from station one, which was like three or four minutes away. Um, and then obviously that whole four minute delay would have caused some more heart damage. 
So the nice thing is we were in quarters, we were in our stations, we were able to take care of the individual. They actually came by a few weeks later and brought the guys pies. So I think, again, that's that whole pie and cookie thing. Um, so video conferencing allows for us to keep in our, our respected areas so that we can respond to those emergencies when they come up. Um, allows them to stay in their response areas, reduces delay in patient care, which is the chief's number one priority, and then everybody gets the same message. If I come out and I teach a class, and in four hours from now another group comes in and I teach the class again, they're going to get the same gist, but there may be a few things, ah, oh, you know, I forgot to mention this in the first group, or I forgot to mention this this morning. So this way the group gets the same information across the board, which is really, really nice. So we've been implementing, we've had this implemented for a while now, and it's worked phenomenally. Battalion chiefs in the morning will actually have their lieutenants sit in front of the cameras and they'll go through the daily duties for the morning and talk about the day of, of festivities for them. Um, really makes phone calls and all that other kind of fun stuff for the battalion chief cut down drastically. Kind of lets them see the look of the battalion chief's eyes and says when he says it's important, they can see it in his eyes. It's important. Uh, just not the battalion chief saying it's important. So, but great system, not really that expensive. We got on a grant, which was really nice. Uh, again, Another one of those technology things that really has helped us. Closed caption video system. Ever since 9-11, people have gotten a little, I say a little crazy, a little overboard with some cameras, but there are places where cameras definitely are needed. Schools, public assembly areas. Pictures here I'm showing you. This is training from earlier this month. Uh, every year, Huntley Fire and Huntley Police, we train together and we call it active uh, violence scenarios and we usually use a school uh, god forbid we should ever have something at one of the schools where you know, a columbine type setup or you know we hear about all over the country all over the world that these things happen so we actually train for those things so we're actually able to tap into the camera systems and the school district has every one of their school buildings in a camera system i can actually pull it up and these are all all, all these pictures you're seeing were actually taken from my ipad I just did a screenshot of it, saved it, and then I put it in my PowerPoint, which was great for today. Um, these are all live camera feeds, uh, live video feeds. I can do still shots, I can do video capture, I can do audio. It's really nice. It's great for us. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, we're going there and activate a fire alarm. Is it a fire alarm or is it an actual fire? We can look at those things. You know, We can go throw up a couple cameras and see if there's any smoke in the area. Um, if the police officers are going to somewhere that they have an irate parent. You know, they can actually see the irate parent and how irate are they. Everybody's definition of irate is a little bit different. I come from a Sicilian family, so irate to me, to someone else is way different. So <laughs> <coughs> it's good to see what's going on. So we have these cameras in all the school districts uh, that, that we cover. We have some of our major businesses, uh, some of our major buildings, uh, obviously the village halls and stuff like that. But again, uh, closed caption video conferencing system is phenomenal, easily accessible by any smart device. For anything, my, uh, and, uh, and I, uh, we go to Willow Creek Church in Huntley High School, and um, we're on a committee with there, and I'll be sitting there, and I'll pull up a camera, and my wife smacks me in the shoulder. She's been paying attention in the past, and I'm messing around with the camera system. And I put that away, so she yells at me, but I'm always testing the systems because it, you never know when it's not going to work. So it's always nice to test, and even though I'm not really supposed to be testing, I'm supposed to pay attention to the sermon, but uh, she understands, and I think so does he, so I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some other technology. So uh, a long time ago, probably eight or nine years ago, we have a, a board of elected trustees, a board of five, and um, uh, myself, my two deputy chiefs, um, a secretary, a courting secretary, uh, an attorney. So there's about 10 of us for a board meeting, <coughs> which we have to do packets for. And our packets average about 100 to 120 pages a packet. Um, well, lately they've been a little bit higher, yeah, 140 page packets. Uh, there's been a lot of information lately. Um, but I have to make a 140 page packet for all 10 individuals and then hand those out. Well, if you take that 140 times 10, times 12 months, like 15,000 pages of paper a year that we were generating um, just for our trustee packets. Not to mention the amount of time it took for me to put it together. That's just a piece of paper that doesn't count toner, time to put them together. If I messed one up, then I had to start all over. If I put the wrong page in the wrong order, it was a nightmare. So one day I came up with the idea, why don't we go to iPads? I created as a PDF document, 
Uh, but as we all know, PDF works really easy, very well. I could just change it on the fly if I had to change a document, and here we go. So we haven't had a trustee packet in probably eight years now, saving thousands of trees and thousands of man hours uh, to get the Board of Trustees their information for their packets just by using an iPad and using a PDF document that's free. So just those simple things, saving a taxpayer dollars. Our return on investment was literally six months because we obviously had to buy iPads. Our return on investment was about six months. And after that, they were free. They actually paid for that after that. So it was that simple. We haven't stopped since. They've been phenomenal. Um, smartphones, all chief officers, senior officers, their smartphones. Again, all of our technology comes on our smartphones. And then our radio system. Our radio system has gone leaps and bounds. We are in a digital hybrid system now to where it's an encrypted system. Uh, VHF and UHF systems used to work great back in the day, but now that we have hospitals in town, we have places like Weber Stevens that are three quarters of a million square feet, those radios just don't have the penetration to where if I'm in the parking lot of Weber Stevens, I can't talk to my guys inside because you know they're a couple hundred thousand square feet inside that I can't get to them. Uh, the new technology and radio systems allows us to penetrate that brick and mortar and steel and glass and allows me to have communications with my troops on the inside. The last thing we need to do is if someone gets hurt or injured, one, I need to know where they're at, and two, we need to know how to get them out. Uh, so even in, as simple as just our old radios, our VHF radios that we used to carry uh, that were literally the size of a, a small Buick, um, have gone down there. That's the new radios that we, we carry now. Um, again, it's, it's a small computer. It is literally a computer system. Um, a little more expensive, but again, worth its weight in gold. Questions? Oh boy, all kinds of hands went up. <laughs> Since you stood up in the back and you were up first, we'll go with you. We'll get you a, we'll get you a microphone. You got a microphone here. I have two real quick questions. First of all, is it better to call from a landline if you have one or your cell phone? And the second question, is uh, everybody going to Sherman now from this district, Sherman Hospital? Okay, so landline versus cell phone, great question. Uh, always, if you can, oh, first let's show a hand. Who still has a good old fashioned mom bell phone in your house? Okay, that is, ex that is not normal in the rest of the county. <laughs> Del Webb, by far, and, I, and I, I'm not teasing you, Del, Del Webb, by far, is really the only community that still uses Mom Bell telephone lines. Everybody else in the county uses cellular. 82% of all 911 calls placed in the county of McHenry are cellular calls. So that tells you how many cell phones are out there. It's always better if you're near a landline, a good old fashioned mob bell landline, to dial that uh, because that actually gives me a hard address of actually where you're at. If you're standing in the middle of a farm field on your cell phone, I'll have a rough guesstimation of where you're at by a couple thousand feet, which I should be able to find you no problem. Um, but again, that's if everything's working properly, if you have a newer phone, <coughs> if the cell towers are all working, if something, a tornado didn't come through and knock out towers. All kinds of variables, uh, wind and ice and snow and all that. So, of course, landlines always preferred, but they both work just as good. Uh, second question, right now, the number one hospital is Huntley Centauri Hospital, where we're going right now. That seems to be the number one hospital everybody wants to go to. Actually, the number one patient transported from the Huntley Fire Department to uh, the new hospital was, uh, they opened up at 8 o'clock, was 8.03. And she was very excited that she was the first Huntley patient there. So. Uh, Chief, Chief, back here. Uh, I recently uh, attended the uh, golf cart parade mm -hmm. in which the fire department was there. And I noticed they had like a all-terrain vehicle with a stretcher on the back. Yep. Now, obviously that's for getting into remote areas, mm -hmm. right, where you can get there. Okay. But where is that stored, and how does that that apparatus get to that remote area? So that's a specialty vehicle. It's called a gem car. It's an electric car. It's actually made by General Motors. It's a street legal. It does about 35 miles an hour. It has one of those stretchers that we showed in the video on the back of it, so that when that one comes off, we can actually just put it right in the back of an ambulance, and away they can go. It's actually kept on a trailer at our annex building, and it can. It's usually only for special events. So um, like um, the Rib Fest, uh, 
sunset fast, the hunt and they fall fast is usually where it's at. Uh, the parade is a good example, we'll bring it out for that. It's a show off tool, but it's used for those type of festivities. <clears throat> where is it stored? It's stored at the annex building. Why do we not hear sirens in Delaware when the ambulance is called? Why you don't hear them? Well, maybe it's because like living next to the uh, elevated rail tracks in Chicago, after a while you just get used to them. But I assure you the sirens are always on in those breaks when they're driving through town. Three o'clock in the morning, probably not so much. Uh, they're used discretionary. I mean, if there's no traffic, there's no reason to have the sirens on. Uh, but if there's traffic, the sirens are usually on. Does Centegra have a trauma center? So Centegra Huntley has three things that are very important to this community. One, they are a certified stroke facility, which means if you're having a true stroke, they're the hospital that you need to get to. It's either them or Sherman Hospital, they're the only two in the area. Second thing they have is they are a cardiac facility, which means they have cardiac physicians on staff, and they have cardiac cath labs, they actually have two open. They only had one when they originally opened their doors. They quickly learned they needed to open up the second one really fast, and they're already looking at opening up the third one. That's how busy they are there with cardiac cath right now. And then the third thing is they are a level two trauma center. Okay, hello. Uh, somebody recently told me that you put the newer LED lights mm -hmm. in your garage and by your front door that they won't flash like the old light bulbs did if there was an alert. I don't believe that's 100% true. Um, I, I know some do. I, and I can't say 100% because I don't have them in my house, I don't know, but I do know that the houses that we have been to that are LED lighting on there, or the CFI lighting also, and they still, still flash. How do you access the garage door code? So if you're uh, one of those individuals that maybe fall on a regular basis or can't get to your door or maybe wheelchair bound or something like that and we need to get in, and we always can get in, I assure you. There's never a problem with far, far to getting yourself out. It's really the aftermath that the problem is. Um, and I don't like buying doors that often. But if there's something that you need for us to get into your home, my recommendation to you is either go to our web is to go to our website. On the very beginning uh, front page, there's a program called the Premise Alert Program, the PEP program. Fill out a form and uh, send it in to us, and we'll get it in the system. And then it'll be in the system. Okay, any so more? Some of the LED lights that people are installing have sensors in them, so they only come on when it's dark out, and that causes some issues if it's you know, dusk or something when they Yeah, so if they have the photoelectric eye on it, that's a whole other issue. Uh, but LED lighting will still flash. Uh, most of us, or at least a lot of us, now use uh, internet access for our phone service, mm -hmm. probably through Comcast or somebody. Does that also show up as an address, just as an AT&T copper line? Yeah, so a VoIP, which is a voice over IP telephone, is really what it is. Um, we've had a lot of issues over the years with that because you may have AT&T here, but they usually buy it from somebody else that bought it. So literally what comes up on the screen by the dispatcher could be someplace in Arkansas. Um, but they fix that now. So if you're an Illinois resident and you have an address, you'll, your address should come up by law should come up for your voice over IP or internet based type telephone. Yeah, you should have had a form to fill out if you had some kind of uh, IP voice over internet phone. You should have some kind of form you filled out that said for 911, what is your address? You sure you did that? And if not, check with your provider. I have a question here. Yes, um, well, first of all, I'll answer that lady's question. Um, I have all, all LED light bulbs, and my lights still flash. Okay. And who dispatches for Huntley Fire? So right now, um, it's called CECOM, Southeast Communication Center, which is based out of Crystal Lake. It's a regionalized dispatch center. Uh, great news. So for years, we've had what we call fractured services here. Fractured services means depending on which way you were facing, what cell tower you hit, depending on which dispatch center you got. So you could have picked up your phone, dial 911, and got Lake in the Hills or Huntley PD, or you could have picked up your phone, dial 911, and you could have gotten CECOM. 
so now because governor had passed a law a year ago saying that no more fractured services we need to consolidate these dispatch centers because we're wasting a lot of money um i'm happy to say that lake in the hills police department along with huntley police department are now coming to ccom on or before july 1 of 17. they're, they're anticipating somewhere around march so no matter who you are where you're calling from you're going to get the same dispatch center that's going to send you police and fire which is a huge huge thing when it comes to the residents okay it's i think a couple of questions if you guys um minute after meeting will stay you can come up and ask any of the speakers questions we thank you for coming and see you next time thank you please